Good morning, church. Hey, it's good to see you out there. For those of you online, we want to welcome you to our Sunday edition of Thursday Church. And I'm sorry, I'm a little selfish. I like a little energy in the room when I'm getting up here and and preparing to share what God has just been working on my heart about. And so this morning, as we are getting ready to start preparing our minds to think in a new way, I just want to challenge us with this truth that God has instructed us, he has told us the importance of maintaining a posture and an attitude of learning. And it's not just what I'm saying, it's what he says. Listen to Proverbs 9, 9, it says this, instruct the wise and they will be even wiser. Teach the righteous and they will learn even more. So church, we are called to be people who are willingly learning. Just because we age chronologically doesn't mean we have a free pass on learning new things. Just because we've been sitting in a church for a long time doesn't give us a pass on learning new things that God has for each and every one of us every single day. Every single day, he wants to reveal something new to us. And um, this, wor- this morning, I want us to be reminded that as we are learning every single day, our learning can sometimes take place in the most unusual ways. He will take things from our world and make us think, ah, oh, that's what you meant when you said. And so this morning, we are going to be learning from the world of construction. And I'm looking at you, specifically you gentlemen in the room who are saying, who are you to talk about construction? Well, here we go. Would you believe that everything I know about construction, I learned in this very place? Let me explain. For just a moment, I'm going to give you permission to look around the room. If you are physically in this space at 218 Main Street, I'm going to ask you just to look for a moment around this space. Because in this very space that you are seated in, years ago, this place was completely gutted and remodeled. Construction happening all over the place so that one day, One day, we could be doing this very thing of sitting here, worshiping together, learning about God's plan for us. And here's the incredible thing. That construction that was done here, it wasn't done by professional contractors. No, it was done by people like you and I, people who just rolled their sleeves up and said, God, I don't know what I'm doing, but I believe in what you wanna do in this space. And so I am willing to come in after working all day long. I am willing to come in on the weekends. I am willing to sacrifice other things so that this space can be turned into something really cool. So church, we are sitting in a very unique place But here's the thing, it's not just this space. If you happen to visit our church-owned businesses, like the Fort Sackville Project, and you go in there and you donate your gently used items, you find great bargains, or if you meet a friend for lunch at Gracie's Restaurant and enjoy a delicious meal and maybe follow it up with a cupcake afterwards, or If you come down the street and go to 224 Main Street and you visit the Faith Store and you walk in and grab a bar of soap or maybe a a bag of your favorite coffee, I want you to know those spaces were also remodeled, reconstructed. Hard work went into changing those places all for the purpose of ministry so that God could be honored in those spaces. And so, construction is nothing new for us here at Thursday Church. And yes, as Pastor Debbie shared earlier, in six days, a group of us will be going down to build 
construct our 22nd home with Casas per Cristo, which I think is incredible if you look at the size of our church. Yes, that deserves, yeah. Because here's the thing, God honors us when we willingly do the things that he's called us to do, even if it doesn't make sense. Things like construction. But today, we're not going to be talking about building homes. We're not gonna be talking about remodeling or reconstructing old buildings that have been around for a very long time. Buildings with roofs that used to leak a lot. Buildings who have poles everywhere so that you can't always see what you wanna see. We're not gonna be talking about that kind of construction. We're going to be talking about digging wells. That's right, digging wells. And as I've been studying, I've learned that digging wells is a complicated thing. You see, it's, it's not as easy as just taking a shovel that's really good and sturdy out to the backyard and digging a big hole. In fact, just finding the right location for a well can be very tricky uh, and lots of factors go into that. Things like the nearby properties and what is on those properties. Things like the rock formation under the ground. Or how about septic systems and where they drain from. Lots of factors just to first of all identify the place that you want to put the well. Then... Then there's this issue of the process of digging the well. And so I want you to hold on to your hats because in five steps, I'm going to walk us through the process of what it looks like to dig a well. But before I do that, I want you to know that um, this process is so complex that every single state has different rules, regulations, and guidelines that guide the process. That on top of that, the National Groundwater Association has an additional training for contractors so they know what they're doing. There are all different types of wells, but today we're gonna talk about the drilled well. So here we go. Step number one of how to Drill a well used for a home. It starts by this. The process begins with what they call a rotary drilling machine. And basically what that is, is a really big drill. And this drill has a lot of power behind it. And so this drill goes into the earth where the well is to be built. And it pounds and pounds and pounds until it fractures and breaks up this ground layer. Now this ground layer is known as the overburden. And so the overburden is actually filled with lots of different things, depending on where you're building a well. It can be full of loose gravel, sand, rock, clay, maybe even shale. Or it can even be a combination of all these things. And so this machine is drilling down down, down into the ground, and then step two happens after the drill gets all the way through this overburden layer, then it moves into what they call the bedrock layer. Well, here's the thing about the bedrock layer. Yes, it's made of bedrock. That's pretty, that's pretty, pretty creative, isn't it? But this bedrock layer is where actually running water flows naturally. So now we've found the natural water, the hole has been dug, so they take this, um, this really sturdy metal casing. It looks like just a real big pipe and they drop it right into the hole where that hole was dug. And this metal casing has to be sturdy because you see it keeps the overburden layer on top from collapsing in on itself but it also keeps the water able to run up. Oh, but don't let me get ahead of myself. Step three, grout is then used all around this casing. And as the grout is poured in to this earth around the casing, what it does is it acts like a barrier. 
This barrier keeps all the contaminants, all the bacteria, all the rainwater, all the chemical out of that fresh drinking water. And then step four, a pump is lowered through the casing down into the fresh water. And that pump acts to force the water back up through the casing. Okay? And then finally, step five. The, the casing is either capped off or they, uh, they put this adapter. It's called a pitless adapter. And what it does is it funnels the water from the casing into a reservoir or a tank where it can be used for household use. I know. I know by the looks on your faces, I have wowed you all, haven't I? That's right. And I'm guessing you're thinking, what in the world? What are we doing here? How in the world does this have anything to do with my faith, with growing my faith, with developing my faith? What is this all about? Let me answer that question that you might have rolling around in your head with this question. When is the last time you walked to the sink to brush your teeth and you thought seriously about where that water was coming from? When is the last time as your water was heating up, as you prepared to take that nice hot shower after a long day, that you gave thought to where that water was coming from and how you have access to it? You see, every time we turn on a faucet, in our homes, every time we turn on a faucet at our workplace, or even when we go to the restroom here at Thursday Church to turn on our water, did you know that you, my friend, are benefiting from someone else? You are benefiting from someone else's hard work. Now, here's the cool thing. God's word actually speaks about this very thing in Deuteronomy. See, in Deuteronomy, the, the Israelites, God's chosen people, have been wandering and wandering and wandering aimlessly in the wilderness for 40 years. And now they're finally finished and they have arrived. You see, their wandering wasn't because they wanted to see the sights. Their wandering was the result of their disobedience. God punished them by taking this time that was only supposed to last a few days and stretching it out to 40 years. And now here they are in this place, getting ready to cross over into this land that the Lord had told their ancestors, this will be your home and it is good. And before they cross over, their leader Moses says, wait, 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 wait. Let's, let's just take a moment here. Let's take a moment and think. Let's think about what God has been doing over the last 40 years in our wandering. Let's think about the ways that God has provided for us, the way that God has cared for us. Because as I said earlier, that journey was only meant to take 11 days. 11 days, and instead it took 40 years. Think about the packing you do to prepare for a trip for 11 days. I'm thinking about the packing I'm doing to get ready for Mexico. It's very different than the packing you would do if you were getting ready to set off on this journey for decades. You see, they hadn't prepared for food. They hadn't prepared for water. They hadn't prepared for clothing changes or shoe changes. They hadn't prepared for any of that. And yet, and yet, God, God made sure they had absolutely everything they needed when they needed it. Even, even though their wandering was caused by their own disobedience. And that brings us to a really powerful truth we need to wrap our minds around. You see, sometimes we are going to be disciplined. We are going to be corrected because of our own bad choices, because of our own bad decisions. And yet, because God loves us so very much, 
His love is so unconditional that he will care and provide for us even in those moments where we are receiving correction, much like he did with the Israelites. So here we are. Listen to what Moses says to the people in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. The Lord your God will soon bring you into the land that he swore to give you when he made a vow with your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is a land with large, prosperous cities that you, you did not build. The houses are richly stocked with goods that you, you didn't produce. You will draw water from cisterns. Cisterns are basically our modern day version of a well. You will draw water from cisterns that you did not dig. And you will eat from vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. You see, the Israelites were getting ready to head into this promised land. And they were promised cities that were already waiting for them. Cities that had walls that fortified them. They were walking into a space where homes were already built. And not just the homes were already standing, but they were already stocked with supplies and goods. They were walking into communities where fresh water was already available to them. Think about this. When those wells were dug, they did not have the machinery that we have today. The trees, the plants were already producing delicious food. And even though God promised the abundance of these great gifts to his chosen people, the Israelites. They still came at a cost to someone. Someone had to do the legwork to make those things a reality. Someone had to build. Someone had to dig. Someone had to go through the sweat equity of farming and planting. All those things that they were ready to enjoy came at the cost or the expense to someone else. You see, we all want, we all enjoy taking part of the abundance. That's a no-brainer. But we don't always want to do the work or to accept the responsibility to experience the abundance. You see, we have something in common with those Israelites all those thousands of years ago. We too have been offered abundance. We have been offered this abundance that we have not worked to deserve, to earn. We have all been offered this gift of abundance that's simply given because Jesus hung on a cross and said, I love you so much that I will sacrifice even my life for you. Because, because I want you to know the goodness of my Father God. I want you to experience it for yourself. And that abundance, it isn't just in the far off distance. That abundance is meant for today as well. And so Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, and as God's partners, we beg you, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. You see, we're confronted with the same decision, with the same choice that those Israelites were. When they were given this amazing gift of abundance they hadn't earned or worked for, what kind of attitude would they receive it with? When we are being offered this gift of God's amazing sacrifice of his son, what do we do in response to that? And Paul is saying, and out of gratitude and appreciation, for what God has done for you, then you, you go. You go and dig wells too. Now hear me. 
God doesn't ask each and every one of us to get in a plane, to take off to a faraway country, to build physically a well that will water people or a village that doesn't have access to fresh water. Some of us, I believe, yes, are called to do things like that. But just because God does not call you to go to a faraway land to do something like that does not let you off the hook. Every single one of us, out of response to what God has given to us, has been instructed to go and lay the groundwork so that someone else has the chance to meet his son Jesus, so that someone else has the chance to experience this living water that only comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, laying this groundwork, it might look like going abroad and doing something. But for most of us, what it's going to look like is simply this, is intentionally choosing to live our lives as Jesus did to love in the manner that he loved. Even when we are confronted with people who are so very difficult to love or worse yet will never love us back in return. We are called to offer compassion and kindness even when people don't deserve it or haven't earned it. We're called to give mercy and forgive people when they wrong us, even though they've done it more than one time laying the groundwork so that someone else gets to meet Jesus, it begins by us living like him. Because you see, when people start looking at our lives and seeing that we look different, that we respond differently than the world responds, then Jesus becomes very attractive and they want to learn more about him. But here's the thing. Living like Jesus is a simple thing to say, but it isn't easy to do. And there will be times that living like Jesus will be downright hard, that it will be difficult. In fact, if we're really honest, living like Jesus will sometimes cause us to suffer. It will cause us to hurt to experience pain. And Paul, he understands this so well. And so he offers encouragement and comfort because you see, we've got to get this stuff straight in our minds. We've got to know what we're doing and what we're about before we find ourselves confronted with those difficult moments. Because in those difficult moments when we are being challenged to walk like Jesus, even when it hurts, we've got to have a plan in place. So would you turn to page 963 in the Bibles around the room? We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. For those of you connecting with us online, would you grab your Bible and open it up so you can see it for yourself? If you've got your phone handy, just swipe open your Bible app. But this is one of those passages that you might want to mark because you're going to need to be reminded of this. Here we go. We're starting at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, um, starting with verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source, the source of all comfort. He comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort comfort that God has given to us. For the more we suffer for Christ, because as we said, there will be times we are asked to suffer for him. But the more we suffer for Christ, get this, the more God showers us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighted down with troubles, it's for your comfort. It's for your salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things that we suffer. We are confident that as you share in your sufferings 
or our sufferings, you also will share in the comfort God gives us. We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble that we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed. We were overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure and thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God. Who raises the dead and he rescued us from mortal danger and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him and he will continue rescuing us and you are helping us by praying for us. And then many people will give thanks because God has graciously answered so many prayers for our safety. You see, in the midst of that suffering, God, in the midst of the heartache and pain, God, in the midst of situations and circumstances that are overwhelming to us, God says, I have not left you. I have not abandoned you. I am right there. And then he does this incredible thing. And he offers us this divine comfort, a comfort that's not just kind words written on a page, but this comfort in those moments of hardship, in those moments of heartache, this comfort gives us power, gives us strength, gives us peace the ability to move forward, even though it feels like we're sinking where we are. You see, Paul speaks of this because he's lived it. And he says, it wasn't just a trial. It wasn't just a heartache. We were crushed and we questioned whether we could go on or not. Have you ever been in circumstances where you really wondered, God, I don't know that I can move forward from this? Because if you've been there, Paul experienced the same thing. So you are in good company. But here's the best part. And as Paul was hurting, as Paul was recognizing his own inability to dig his way out of those circumstances. Because sometimes, even through our best effort, we can't fix. We cannot fix the circumstances that we face. And so in that complete inadequacy, that is where Paul learned some really valuable things. But here's the thing, Paul didn't just learn the lessons and then move forward to the next mission trip. Paul took those lessons and he said, you know, there's value. Even though we had to experience pain, hardship, agony, anguish, there's value in that because God can teach us through that. But even more, God can use those moments to teach other people as well. And so Paul, in this, in this letter, is encouraging this church, this new church in Corinth. He's saying, brothers and sisters, I want you to know that this work of living like Jesus is hard. And you are going to face days where you question whether you want to do this or not. There will be days that it is easier to walk out than to walk forward. But let me tell you, and in those moments, God can use them. In those moments, there is value and purpose. And so let me encourage you. Let me encourage you by sharing the lessons that God shared with me. And here they are. Lesson number one, God is worthy of praise, period. In the midst of those moments where praise is difficult to get out of our mouths because life hurts. If, if we will train ourselves to be people of praise at all times, in all situations, then what happens is our focus is changed from our circumstances 
and becomes focused on who God is. Our circumstances will no longer determine whether or not God is worthy of praise. But I would challenge that when we focus on God, even in the midst of those difficult moments, that our circumstances might actually start looking more bearable. Lesson number two, experiencing hardships helps us relate to other people. In life, there is no sweeter encouragement. There is no more powerful comfort than for someone who has already walked the road that you are being asked to walk to look back and say, hey, I've made it to the other side and it's okay. You will make it. Keep pushing forward. They know because they've been there. They've done it. So God is worthy of praise. Experiencing hardships helps us relate to others. Lesson three, it's in those darkest storms that we find that God can be trusted. Because you see, when the sun is shining, we don't have to trust God in the same way we do when the storms are beating against us. And lesson four, when we choose to live honorably, when we choose to live honorably, because my friends, it is a choice, then God is glorified. As each one of us walks through life, we will either attract people to or we will repel people from Jesus. Think about that for a minute. The words that we speak on a day-to-day basis to our families, to our friends, will either attract them to Jesus or repel them from Jesus. The actions that we do, our behaviors will either attract people to Jesus or repel people from Jesus. What about our thought life and our attitudes? Our attitudes, our thoughts will either attract people to or repel people from. We've got a big job. This living like Jesus, it's not easy. But here's the thing. In those moments where it's difficult, in those moments where we are asked to walk like Jesus, even when it's hard, and even when it's so much easier just to isolate ourselves and hunker down and hide because it hurts too much, it's in those very moments that if we would surrender them to God's care, that people actually get to see him shining through us in miraculous ways. Because when we choose, when we choose to allow other people into those moments that are difficult, that's when they get to see the reality of our faith. We can talk a good faith talk. And when life is good, it's easy. But what about when life is not good? They see the reality of our faith. They see the reality of God's provision. How is God showing up in the midst of these storms? They see the reality of God's comfort, the way he comforts us powerfully, the way he strengthens us, the way he propels us forward. You know, this passage is one of those passages that that makes me think, maybe, just maybe, we need to be re-looking, rethinking about our circumstances, specifically the circumstances that are hard. Maybe those circumstances aren't just meant to draw us closer to the Lord. They will. They will draw us closer to the Lord if we'll allow But maybe, just maybe, there's even more than that. Maybe those circumstances are meant to empower us, to equip us, so that one day we 
like Paul, can share the encouragement, can share the comfort to someone else and allow someone else to meet this man named Jesus. So this week, take your seat reminders home. They're all around the room and focus on this question. Will I allow God to use my life? All of it, the good stuff, the ugly stuff, the easy stuff, the hard stuff. Will I allow God to use my life so that someone else has the chance to meet this man named Jesus who can change everything? Amen? Would you pray with me? Father, in this moment where we just quiet ourselves, Lord, can we just be super honest and transparent with you and say there are areas of our lives that are easier to share with other people. There are areas of our lives that are easier to speak about what you're doing in and through us than those areas that we would much rather keep hidden, those areas that are just too dark, too ugly, too scary. And yet, Lord, you have told us that if we will surrender even those difficult, hidden, painful moments, that you will come in and do this amazing thing where you will change and transform that yuck so that you can be glorified. So, Father, would you give us the courage to allow you to use not just part of our lives, but all of our lives for your glory so that someone else might find encouragement from what we have walked through, so that someone else might find comfort from what we have experienced. But God, on our own, we're not going to be willing to do that. So would you help us with that? Lord, I pray that, um, that you would just continue to teach us Help us to be people who are constantly learning, who are constantly growing, who are constantly changing to be more like your son. And Father, we will give you the glory for that. Father, if there is someone in this space who who hasn't ever taken the time to accept this gift of abundance that you have given through the death and the resurrection of your son. Father, I pray that today would be the day that they would say, you know what? I want that. I want that abundance that you're talking about. I want that, that comfort that comes that's powerful and strong. Father, would you be near to that person? Would they recognize, Lord, that being in relationship with you is better than anything else this world will ever offer? Father, continue to use us to reach people, whether here in our community or far, far away. But God, to you be the glory. Father, we ask these things in your son's holy and powerful name. And all God's people said, amen.